You guys liked Batman Earth-1, didn't you? Well, the Earth-1 universe is rather vast. There's multiple superheroes in this universe from the main DC universe. You have Batman, you have Superman, you have the Teen Titans, you have Wonder Woman, and I believe there's a Green Lantern coming out soon. Don't hold me to that, but we're going to keep giving you some of these Earth-1 storylines on a maybe weekly basis. So let's give you the origins of Superman in Earth-1. A story begins with young Clark Kent boarding a train to the big city of Metropolis. In the back of his head, he thinks about his mother, Martha, asking, why not just fly there? As Clark steps out into the city, he thinks, because this is different. This is more real. After getting unpacked at a hotel, he decides to take in some of the sights where they walk through downtown. Even in the big, bright city, there are still some dark people within it. As he turns down an alleyway, a man with a gun appears telling him to hand over his wallet, watch, and phone. His eyes begin to glow red. He can fix this right now. He can end this. And he tells the man that he should put the gun down and just walk away. The man laughs. Ooh, scary contacts. Big freaking deal. No sooner does the man say that, but Clark fires a blast, knocking the man down. And then he vanishes. Clark knew that he was different, and all he wanted was to just fit in, lead a normal life. He tried out for the local football team, and even there, he was still better than everyone else on the team. The largest man on defense stood in front of him, and Clark just ran right through him. But still, there was something missing. So the next day, Clark stopped by the Neodyne Industries looking for a job. The recruiter told Clark that they're not hiring any interns or trainees at the moment, so Clark stops him, telling him, actually, he's applying for applied research and development. The recruiter says that their company only hires the top top five PhD graduates from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. The men behind the glass are the highest paid researchers on the planet and Clark asks, what are they working on now? The recruiter tells him that they just spent the last decade coming up with a way to derive electricity directly from salt water and there are only two equations from figuring that out. Clark looks into the lab and he asks how long they've been working on those two equations and the recruiter says about three years. The gaps are noted on the big screen out there. He then takes out a notepad and begins to write a formula. He then tells the recruiter to hand this over to the researchers. The recruiter takes the paper telling him that he's not sure what this is supposed to mean and Clark tells him just do it. A few seconds later, inside of the lab, the recruiter and the researchers begin to talk, and then they stop. And then the researchers jump up, giving each other a high five. The recruiter comes back, telling Clark not to leave. Whatever he does, don't move from that spot. And as the night falls, Clark sits in his bed on the phone as Martha asks how the job search is going. He tells her really well. He barely got started, and he already has some great prospects. One of them is enough to take care of them for the rest of their lives. Martha says that she doesn't need much. She's got her house. Her retirement, the memories of Jonathan and him. So there isn't much that she could even need. Martha goes on telling him, it's nice to bring up a son who just wants to give back. But the real question for her son is, is that what you want to do? So trust her when she says that anything that he decides, as long as he's making himself happy. The next day, Clark floated around thinking of what and where he could go. There are so many options for someone like him. And as he passes a coin newspaper machine, he sees one labeled the Daily Planet and he drops his coins in. A short while later at the Daily Planet, the editor-in-chief Perry White looks over Clark's resume. However, before he could fully read it, the reporter Lois Lane walks up to Perry asking, why did he cut her third paragraph on City Hall? Perry tells her that the first reason was that it was redundant and Lois says that, that was her favorite paragraph. And Perry says, well, thank you for giving him a reason number Number two. As Lois goes on, Perry calls out the photojournalist Jimmy Olsen, asking what happened to the pictures that he was supposed to upload a half an hour ago. Jimmy says that he did, but the server kind of choked on the files as he was sending them again. Once everyone finishes their business with Perry, he turns to Clark, telling him, Look, you seem like a decent guy. However, the planet isn't what it used to be. The other players are kicking our butts. Ad revenue is down. Circulation is down. Hell, we might not even be here in a year. If you really want to work here, I'm going to need you to prove that you're worthy of the planet. So take an application and maybe we'll see each other again. As Clark gets out of the building, he looks down at the application and he crumples it, tossing it into the trash. He looks into the sky and suddenly he begins to float up, flying towards space. He looks down on this planet thinking that back when he was a child, he asked the big question. Who is he? What is he? His father Jonathan says... God's honest truth, we don't know. We wanted to hold off until you were older to tell you what we knew. But with the way things were developing, we couldn't wait any longer. Clark looks at him and tells him, show me. And Martha brings out a small metal object. She tells the story of how they found him. There was a loud sonic boom and something came crashing down to the earth. His father and her ran over to the crash site and they found him there. And they grabbed onto him before whatever it was could explode. Afterwards, there was nothing on the news about the crash. Just some black helicopters circling the area. But before they were even back home, they noticed that there was something special about him. Martha pulls back the cloth covering the box to show Clark the piece of the meteor. 
And Jonathan tells him that they had someone look into some of the shavings of it and they discovered that it wasn't from Earth. You aren't from Earth, son. Back in the current times, Clark flies back to Earth to visit his father's grave and he tells him, I'm sorry for coming by so late. I wanted to tell you that I can't do it. I know it's something that you and mom wanted, but I just can't do it. If I expose myself to the world, I will always be on the run, but there are still a lot of things that I can do to help people, openly or otherwise. I can find cures, expose corruption, give the average guy a leg up in the world. Those things can still mean something and I won't disappoint you. As the sun comes up, Clark says that it looks like it's going to be another beautiful day. He wishes he could see it, but they'll talk again. Meanwhile, over at the 2nd Army Advanced Technology Division, Major Sandra Lee heads into work on their biggest project yet, figuring out what the hell it is that they're putting together. Unbeknownst to them, however, is the ship that Clark crash-landed in. Back with Clark, he walks over to the hotel and he sees fire trucks speeding by. He looks up and he sees a fire, and that fire is his room. He rushes past the police and the firefighters into it to grab what he can, which is his costume that his mother had sewn for him, and a piece of the ship debris. Clark speeds back out without being seen, and he floats in the sky looking at the piece of metal. The metal is giving off a weird kind of energy and then it shocks Clark. He yells, ouch, and then says, so that's what pain is. And then he looks closer at the metal. As he looks, he sees something written on it, something written across the molecules that make up the metal. And then the piece gives him another shock, hitting Clark right in the head. As his body crashes into the ground, he clutches that piece of metal on that costume that his mother made for him. Over at the planet, Perry goes over some of the information with Lois and Jimmy when they start to hear tick, tick. And the three look out the window and Perry says, mother of God, before him are a swarm of alien ships hovering over the city. The alien evaders begin to fire on the US military. And the first person to run outside is Jimmy to take pictures. However, this invasion is not just happening in the US, but it's also happening in Rome, Hong Kong, and other major parts of the world. Over with Clark, the part of the ship that he was holding begins to play back some things, and he could see and hear things. Two people discussing something about him, and then they're gone in a fiery blaze. He leans up, grabbing his head in pain, asking, what the, was, was that me? But before he can answer his own question, he looks up to see the alien ships, and he jumps into action. Back in the city, the aliens start to land, and they walk out in mechanized suits, and they continue to destroy everything in their path. And suddenly, a screen appears over those suits, and a man's face appears, and announcing that they would have made contact sooner, but it took almost 10 minutes to fully analyze your language. Really, this world would do better if you would all learn one language, but it matters not now. My name is Tyrell, and I come from a planet that you've never heard of. I'm here to kill your world, should that become necessary. We've spent the last 20 years looking for someone. If he is hiding, then we shall continue to attack until he is provoked enough to reveal himself. If it turns out that he is not here, we will leave your world and try somewhere else, but only after several million of you are dead. Clark stands on top of a building watching these events unfold and he looks at his costume and he flies off. He rockets down through the mechanized suits and then he goes into Neodyne Labs to hand over a piece of what he had taken from the suits. He tells the recruiter that he has something for them to analyze to see if they can stop this. The recruiter says that he's sorry, but that's not his department. His insurance doesn't even cover alien evasions, so he's just gonna find the deepest hole and ride this out. The recruiter then goes back to talking on the phone and leaves the rest of the staff, not even attempting to look for a solution. Back in the streets, Jimmy continues taking pictures of one of the suits as it stops before him. Tyrell asks, why are you not running like the rest of the humans. And Jimmy tells him, I'm a news photographer. We don't run away. And Tyrell tells him, that is noble. Almost plausible, if not for the many others who have fled. Clark watches the two of them interact, and just as Tyrell pulls back to attack the young boy, Clark jumps in and lands right on the suit. One by one, the suits are destroyed, and Tyrell says, finally, our target is found. Now step forth into the light. Clark flies back to the rooftop where he left his costume, and he thinks back to when Martha and John first gave it to him. Why is it so colorful. Martha says that she tried to dye it, but the material from the ship didn't change colors. It's really a good thing, though, because people will be focused on the colors and not his face. He then asks, well, why wouldn't I just wear a mask? And Martha says, because people need to see how powerful he is. Wearing a mask would just terrify them. The mask is what he will wear the rest of the time. The room goes silent and Clark looks at the costume again and he asks, so what's with the yes? Jonathan opens up a bottle of soda and he says, because you're not just different. You're more powerful than any man in history. So unique in all of the world. Extraordinary. Not just any man. More than just a man. You are a Superman. So Clark put on the costume and he floats above the city as Superman. Clark flies down to the ground, crushing the ground beneath his feet, and with one punch he takes out an entire group of mechanized suits. More alien ships appear and they begin to fire as the jets pass by, and Clark leaps up grabbing one of those ships and rips it in half. But before he can continue protecting everyone, Tyrell himself shows up knocking Clark through a building. Clark catches himself telling him, that won't happen again, and he blasts back to the ground into Tyrell. While he gets a few punches in, Tyrell punches back into his throat and then he slashes into his neck. Tyrell 
Tyrell tells Clark, I was hoping that you would have some idea of the troubles that you've caused, but I can see from the blank look in your eyes that you are blind to the truth as all but a few of your ancestors were. The death of Krypton was not an accident. It was an assassination. My people shared the same star as Krypton, but while Krypton was the fourth planet from the sun, ours was the fifth. Though the two planets evolved in a similar path, my planet was much harder as our resources were far fewer. Every 20 years, when our planets became close enough for space travel, there was a war. All of the things that Krypton had that they didn't. Things that they had that Krypton did not. This went on until someone appeared before them and came to them with a proposition. With his cooperation, he will provide the means to destroy Krypton. Probes that will penetrate the planet's surface and create an energy field, locking in the heat from the planet's core. The heat will build up, and before they realize what is happening, it'll be too late for them. Thus, your planet was destroyed. However, there was one ship that managed to escape, and we have searched for you ever since. As Tyrell goes on with his story, Clark stops him and he says, Growing up, I loved to read adventure stories, but I always cringed when the bad guy stopped to tell the good guy his plans. Never made much sense to me. Tyrell tells him, Of course it wouldn't make much sense. That is, if perhaps the rules of good and bad were reversed. You see, right now, all I'm doing is trying to keep your heightened senses so focused that you didn't notice anything else until it was too late to stop it. Clark looks back to see the massive drills all over the world getting ready to drill straight into the Earth's core. His eyes turn red and he shouts, Pull them back! Pull them back now! Tyrell tells him, no, and do say hello to the light of your fathers. Suddenly, a red blast shoots down from Tyrell's ship into Clark, and he explains, we have acquired new abilities for the stars. With this red star light, there is nothing that you could do but feel hopeless and powerless. The pressure of the blast pins Clark to the ground, and watching from the outside is Jimmy. He hands his camera over to Lois, and he tries to crawl inside of the red light, but it pushes him to the ground as well. Lois helps Jimmy back out, and he says that there's nothing that they can do, and she looks at a cement truck and says, like hell there isn't. She hops into the truck and she begins to drive into that light. A chain is dangling from the back and Clark grabs onto it as Lois continues to drive, pulling him out of the light. Jimmy asks, did we get him? And Clark stands back up. So Lois tells him, yeah, we got him. With no words, Clark jumps into the skies to face Tyrell and the two forces collide, shattering the windows around them. But this time, Clark doesn't let up his attacks. He punches into Tyrell and then he fires a heat blast straight into Tyrell's eyes. However, Clark begins to feel something calling to him. Back at the second army advanced technology Division, the scientists report that they've completed rebuilding the ship, but something is going on with it. The ship begins to turn on, and then it rockets out of the facility into the sky. Tyrell grabs at his face, shouting, Making a stand against me will not stop the destruction of this world. Is there any final words to the billions who will die for sheltering you? Clark thinks on it, and he says, Uh, duck? Tyrell asks him, what? And then Clark's old ship smacks right into Tyrell. As it comes back around, Clark looks at it and he says that he's seen this before. He gets into the ship and he flies it straight into Tyrell's ship. Tyrell screams, no! And he flies into the ship only to see Clark around destroying it from the inside. The computers announce that the fusion reactor has been breached. And Tyrell shouts that with the red starlight, both of our powers will be neutralized. We will both be killed in the ship's explosions. And Clark cracks his knuckles and says, then we stay here. And he punches into Tyrell. Clark beats down on him and some of the ship's parts fall and collapse right on top of him. Through his bloody mouth, he shouts, you have won nothing. Others like me will come and finish this. And Clark tells him, maybe so, and maybe they will come, but not today. And he flies off. Tyrell begins to laugh. <laughs> you still don't know. You don't know about the... But before he can finish his words, the ship explodes. Clark thinks back to what Martha has told him, that there will be a time when he doesn't have to hide himself. He will be able to live his life and show the world what he can do, and then he can fly. He hurries back to the ground as the emergency crews begin to help everyone. And when there's a yell from behind, the recruiter from Neodyne runs up to him telling him, Look, I wanted to come and find you and offer you a job. You know, we can make boatloads of money here. Clark asks, How can I even think about that when all of this just happened? And the recruiter says, Yeah. It's a real shame, but they're okay. The company's okay. No point in looking back, right? Clark turns back to the recruiter and he tells him, Sorry, not my department. With the city slowly returning to normal, Clark gets out to get himself some new clothes and his new mask. Later at the Daily Planet, Lois and Jimmy go over what they got from the invasion, and they see that they were the only news outlet that got pictures of Clark that were clear. Perry asks, what are they supposed to call this guy? And then Clark's voice in the background says, Superman, because that's the name his parents gave him. Perry looks at Clark walking into the office, and he asks, how would you know? And Clark tells him, I got it all in this interview that I just had with him an hour ago. Within seconds, Perry clears a desk for Clark and tells him, get to it and write. Clark sits at his new desk smiling, and Lois asks, why here? You could have gone to any place with that. And Clark does not well. When I was out there with everyone, I saw the two of you. And you didn't back down. You didn't walk away. 
as if you were saying to the world, stay and die for the truth. Lois says, well, that at least proves you were out there. There's no way that you would have heard me say that, but I never saw you out there. She shrugs it off, telling him, oh well. So long as you're telling the truth, you'll fit right in. Jimmy pats him on the shoulder, telling him, Welcome to the asylum! As the news stations report on this new super guy, the world seems to have mixed feelings about the new hero. Some are happy, some are scared, but overall, they're pretty positive. Meanwhile, in the Arctic, two researchers complain that maybe coming here for research wasn't such a good idea. While they talk, something shoots down, and one of the researchers asks if that was just a sound or something else. The other tells him, nah, must have been the wind. Nothing ever happens up here. And inside the hole that was just made, Clark takes his ship to hide underground, and he says that he can sense intelligence coming out of it. There's a sentience to it, so teach him. Tell him who he was. Where did he come from? What is he supposed to do? The ship tells him that his task is to survive, use his powers well and wisely, and avenge the murder of his homeworld. Back at the Daily Planet, Jimmy sits on the rooftop with Lois asking, what is he doing? And Jimmy tells her, I'm waiting. You know, for him to arrive. Lois tells him, you know, it could be decades before we can wrap our arms around this. And Jimmy stops her shouting, there, I've got my shot. And that's when he snaps a picture and we can see Superman flying back through the town. And there you have it, guys, the origins of Superman Earth-1. Now, give me a vote down below, and I'm going to have Dan or Houston actually count up your comments and see who has won. Do you want Batman Volume 2 next? Do you want Superman Volume 2 next? Do you want Wonder Woman Volume 1 or Teen Titans as the next Earth-1 storyline that we will be covering? If you want to find out about the Earth-1 timeline in general, check out this playlist right over here. You'll see something brought to you by YouTube, and you can subscribe to the channel if you want to support us and help us grow and give you more amazing comic books. And if you want to do more to support us more directly, please visit our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash monster, where you can find me and the rest of the team streaming on mostly every single day and night and that is how you can support us now i will see you next time right here